Every day we turn on the TV and there's more bad news. Another environmental catastrophe somewhere or more starving refugees or innocent victims in war zones. And most of us are busy trying to make ends meet in our own lives and we see these images and feel helpless to do anything about it. And I think the deep shame we feel about that is paralyzing, certainly one of the reasons that we turn away. The object of this documentary is to look at the flaws in our systems that allow these things to happen and the mechanisms that actually work against us and to show you a very simple but powerful way that we can actually change the world we live in. The material for this film is taken from facts available to the public and from interviews with some of today's leading thinkers. However, we do live in a world full of conspiracy theories, and all I ask is that you keep an open mind, but question everything. Because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Miss Lewinsky. I think that gay marriage should be allowed. I do not believe that gay marriages should be legal. I am honored to be here with Barack Obama. So shame on you, Barack Obama. Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, these countries are tiny compared to the Soviet Union. They don't pose a serious threat to us. Iran is a grave threat. We can end illegal immigration. We're never ever going to be able to totally control immigration. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I think never said that, that is... No, it's absolutely not. What I said was... Uh, it's been pretty well confirmed. There are no knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know, we don't know. One of the most important beliefs that people have about politicians is that politicians do whatever polls tell them to do. We hear a lot of complaint about the lack of strong leadership, that politicians find out what the public wants and then they pander to it, or at least they say they'll pander to it. Now what this idea of the poll-driven politician creates is the impression that the political system may have all kinds of problems, but on the whole, it's responsive and accountable to the public. So, how do we explain this contradiction between the myth that politicians reflect the public and the reality that on most economic issues, they actually ignore public opinion? Media influence on public opinion has been studied for many years now. We know, for example, that the media often play what's called an agenda-setting role. Public concern about issues tends to follow media coverage of those issues, rather than any changes in the real world. The media create the impression that the American public has a real choice. You can choose Bush or you can choose Gore. The implication being that they're both very different. But on substantive budgetary or economic issues, the differences between them are really on the margins. Both leading Democrats and Republicans support a privatized health care system, they support corporate-backed global trade agreements, they support maintaining a Cold War defense budget, and they generally favor the interests of big business. But the media give the impression that Democrats and Republicans represent a broad range of opinion by focusing on civil liberty, non-monetary issues like gay rights or abortion, where Democrats and Republicans really do differ. And this masks the degree of elite consensus. There's a couple of completely logical reasons why our politicians are so similar. The end game for politicians is to get elected. The people who vote are, for the most part, quite moderate in their views. Both parties try to occupy that middle, moderate ground. They are simply responding to that majority in order to get elected. The second reason our politicians are so similar is much more sinister. They answer increasingly to the same master. Thank you so much. We're looking easily at the first billion dollar presidential election. It's much bigger money than we've ever seen in a presidential election. We define a candidate as being serious or not by how much money they can raise, not by what ideas they have, what their record in public service might have been. It's all about money. We really don't have an election anymore. We have an auction. And 
What's for sale? I mean, these are interesting questions to ask. Every incoming president rewards big donors with ambassadorships and other honorary appointments like that. There are all kinds of uh, policy issues. Is a big donor rewarded with a place on a federal advisory panel that might have something to do with, say, approving new drugs or environmental regulations? All of these questions about what's for sale. You know, is government for sale? Is the White House for sale? And I think a lot of Americans suspect that it is. The money flows in for a reason, and the reason is not good government. It is completely unrealistic to expect democracy to deliver representatives who will serve the people's interests when so much money is involved. Having so much money in politics gives all the power to those with money. Yes, we are all still allowed to vote, but how free is our choice? The media in the hands of big business will only present us with politicians that will serve their interests. It would be completely illogical for them to do otherwise. It would also be illogical to expect politicians to change a system that puts them in power. But it certainly begs the question, just what kind of democracy do we have? Do you want to live in a democratic society or do you want to live in the society we have? Uh, which, remember, is not a democratic society and is not intended to be. If you take a course in political theory here, I'm sure they'll teach you that the United States is not a democracy. It's what's called in the technical literature a polyarchy. A polyarchy is a system in which uh, power resides in the hands of those who Madison called the wealth of the nation, the responsible class of men, uh, and the rest of the population is fragmented. That's the way the country was founded. Throughout the history of the world, the rich and powerful have dominated it. And very few people have had any control of their own governments. Most real power in the world is still exercised by those we do not elect. We are still far from governing ourselves. The basis of democracy is the belief that we were all born equal and that that equality must be accepted by those in power. But in the attempts to win those rights, many people have been imprisoned and tortured by those who have power and were determined to retain it. No one in power really wants democracy because democracy will challenge their power structures and their authority. So anyone who comes out with a democratic idea is dismissed as unrepresentative or a troublemaker or an extremist or something. And in this way, the full flow of a public debate about alternatives is being extinguished. Big business is about making money. That's what big business does well. Governments, however, have to balance the needs of the whole society, including big business, based on ethics and social and moral responsibility. But if our corporations have become more powerful than our governments, then we have to understand the effect that is going to have on our systems. Corporations are artificial creations. You might say they're monsters trying to devour as much profit as possible uh, at anyone's expense. The 14th Amendment was passed at the end of the Civil War to give equal rights to black people. And what happens is the corporations come into court, and corporation lawyers are very clever, and they say, oh, you can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. We are a person. A corporation is a person. These are a special kind of persons which are designed by law to be concerned only for their stockholders and not, say, what are sometimes called their stakeholders, like the community or the workforce or whatever. I believe the mistake that a lot of people make when they think about corporations is they, th they think, you know, corporations are like us, they have feelings, they have politics, they have belief systems. They really only have one thing, the bottom line. All publicly traded corporations have been structured through a series of legal decisions to have a very disturbing characteristic. They are required by law to place the financial interests of their owners above everything else, even the public good. 
That's not a law of nature. That's a very specific decision, in fact, a judicial decision. Uh, so they're concerned only for the short-term profit of their stockholders who are very highly concentrated. So the pressure's on the corporation to deliver results now and to externalize any cost that this unwary or uncaring public will allow it to externalize. Towards the end of 1989, a great box of documents arrived at my office without any indication where they came from. And I opened them and um, found in it a complete set of Monsanto files, particularly a set of files dealing with toxicological testing of cows who've been given RBGH. BST, trade name Posilac, is being used in more than a quarter of the dairy herds in the United States, according to Monsanto. The milk has been drunk by a large portion of the American population since the Food and Drug Administration declared it safe for both cows and humans four years and ago. And at that time, Monsanto was saying, there's no evidence whatsoever of any ad adverse effects, we don't use antibiotics, and this clearly showed that they had lied through their teeth. The files described areas of chronic inflammation in the heart, lung, kidney, spleen, also reproductive effects, also a whole series of other problems. There's a cost to the cows. Uh, the cows get sicker when they're injected with RBGH. They're injected with antibiotics. We know that people are consuming antibiotics through their food. And we know that that's contributing to antibiotic resistant bacteria and diseases. And we know we're at a crisis when somebody can go into a hospital and get a staph infection and it can't be cured and they die. That's a crisis. Again and again, we have the problem that whether you obey the law or not is a matter whether it's cost effective. If the chance of getting caught and the penalty are less than it costs to comply, uh, people think of it as being just a business decision. Every living system of Earth is in decline. Every life support system of Earth is in decline. And these together constitute the biosphere the biosphere that supports and nurtures all of life, and not just our life, but perhaps 30 million other species. The typical company of the 20th century, extractive, wasteful, abusive, linear in all of its processes, taking from the earth, making, wasting. We're leaving a terrible legacy. Corporations have gone global. Regardless of whether the corporation can be trusted or cannot be trusted, governments today do not have over the corporations the power that they had and the leverage that they had 50 or 60 years ago. And that's a major change. So governments have become powerless compared to where they were before. Capitalism today commands the towering heights and has displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests. Corporations, by law, must increase their bottom line. In order to expand, they have to sell more products. Sell more products, they must consume more resources. Even going back 50 years, we could see the effect that this was having on our environment. Today, the effects of pollution and industrialization have multiplied tenfold, and the damage is terrifying. And yet these same corporations still want to drill for oil in the Arctic. And that's not just morally blind. That's morally bankrupt. Also, corporate expansion into other countries to get those resources is the cause of so much war and conflict, as you will see in this film. We need our corporations to bring us the technologies, many of which already exist, that can help us address the issues we face. And yet, the system encourages a thirst for short-term profit. I know many of us have heard stories about powerful groups of businessmen who pull the strings of governments from behind closed doors. And so many rumors have sprung up around organizations like the Bilderbergs and the Council on Foreign Relations that it's really difficult to know what to believe. However, it is an interesting fact the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States is not actually owned by the government. It is owned by a private banking cartel. Now, whoever these men are that can loan money to governments have to be some of the most influential men in the world, and yet we don't know who they are. Not all conspiracy theories are just theories. 
And the research for this film pulled up some interesting quotes. Gold is valuable because it is relatively rare. Like gold, the value of money is determined by how much money is in circulation. One would think the power to regulate the money supply that controls our economy and affects our lives in every way would be in the hands of the government of the people. But surprisingly, it is not. The power to control the money supply is in the hands of the Federal Reserve Bank it is important to note the Federal Reserve is not a government organization. It is a private banking cartel. The Federal Reserve System is a banking cartel. Uh, it's no different than a banana cartel or an oil cartel or the sugar cartel. It just happens to be a banking cartel. Congress, in essence, has ceded total control of the value of our money to a secretive uh, central bank. It's a group of very large and powerful private banking interests. Congress knows nothing of the conversations, the plans, and the action taken in concert with other central banks. The government has given it a monopoly, a virtual monopoly, to create the nation's money supply. But all these actions uh, directed by the Federal Reserve alter the purchasing power of our money. This has significant consequences on our economy and our political stability. Wages never keep up with profits on Wall Street and the banks, thus sowing the seeds of class and discontent. It is bewildering to think that we allow an unelected and unregulated group of private bankers to wield such incredible influence over our society. The truth is that most of us will live from paycheck to paycheck in a continued state of struggle, unable to question a system of finance that keeps us on a constant treadmill. And while most of us struggle to stay ahead, billions of dollars in profits flow into the hands of private bankers at our expense. For this is how the system works. Whenever the government needs money, it requests it from the Federal Reserve. But the Fed doesn't just give the money to the government, it loans the money at interest. Every dollar the government loans from the Federal Reserve Bank has to be paid back with interest. This keeps the government, and as such the people, in a continual state of debt. All of our income taxes are paid back to the Federal Reserve to pay off the debt that the government incurs when it borrows money from the Federal Reserve Bank. This is all a matter of public record and easily verifiable should you care to look. The Founding Fathers of America were well aware of the perils of central banks and sought to prevent them. Several central banks were set up but then removed. But the ruthless and powerful bankers, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds, were determined to set up a central banking system in America at any cost. In the early 1920s, J.P. Morgan, one of the most influential bankers of his day, caused massive panic in the markets by spreading rumours that many private banks were about to go bankrupt. This caused widespread panic. Everyone started withdrawing their deposits en masse, and the banks had to call in all of their loans to try and survive. The hysteria destroyed the markets, and the banking elites, having caused the panic, used it to influence politicians and the public that a central bank would bring stability to the system. At a secret meeting in 1910 at the estate of J.P. Morgan on Jekyll Island, the bankers wrote the Federal Reserve Act. They then gave their considerable financial and political support to Woodrow Wilson on the condition he would support the bill if elected. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson signed the bill into law. He later wrote in regret. The 
bankers made immediate moves to increase and consolidate their power. From 1921 to 1929, the banks drastically increased the money supply, making millions of loans. Then, in October 1929, having quietly exited the markets, they started calling in those loans, en masse. The hysteria that followed led to the Great Depression. The conspiring bankers bought up rival banks and massive corporations for pennies on the dollar. Their position of power and influence had become absolute. We get almost all of our information from the media. If we base our opinions on bad or biased information, then everything we believe is suspect. Political debate today is kept within very narrow boundaries, so the media can present both sides of these narrow positions and give the impression we have a free press. However, to talk about left or right wing press is to miss a very important point. Whatever message big business wants carried with whatever slant, the media will carry that story unfailingly. Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. The public just isn't up to dealing with them. And they have to be the domain of what he called a specialized class. Uh, notice that that's the opposite of the standard view about democracy. Uh, there's a version of this expressed by the uh, highly respected moralist and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who was very influential on contemporary policymakers. Uh, his view was that rationality belongs to the cool observer, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And this naive faith requires necessary illusion. The point is that in a military state or a feudal state or what we would nowadays call a totalitarian state, it doesn't much matter what people think because you've got a bludgeon over their head and you can control what they do. But when the state loses the bludgeon, when you can't control people by force, and when the voice of the people can be heard, you have this problem. Uh, it may make people so curious and so arrogant that they don't have the humility to submit to a civil rule, and therefore you have to control what people think. 100 years ago, Sigmund Freud, famous for giving us the science of psychological analysis, suggested that the ideal of individual freedom, central to the idea of democracy, was impossible. He said our hidden desires were too dangerous. Human beings could never be allowed to fully express themselves, that we must always be controlled and would thus always be discontent. Sigmund Freud's American nephew was Edward Bernays. Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on our society is possibly much greater than Freud. Bernays took the new science developed by his famous uncle and used it to manipulate the masses. Bernays is the man who invented the profession and the term public relations. He worked for most of the major corporations and advised politicians on how to win favour with the public. Like Freud, Bernays was convinced that humans were driven by irrational forces, but by stimulating our inner desires and then sating them with consumer products, he created a new way to manage the irrational behavior of the masses. What Eddie got from Freud was indeed this idea that there is a lot more going on in human decision making, not only among individuals, but even more importantly among groups, than this idea that information drives behavior. And so Eddie began to formulate this idea that you had to look at things that would play to people's irrational emotions. And you see, that moved Eddie immediately into a different category from other people in his field and most government officials and managers of the day who thought if you just hit people with all this 
factual information, they would look at that and say, oh, of course. There's a psychology of dress. Have you ever thought about it? How it can express your character? You all have interesting characters, but some of them are all hidden. I wonder why you all want to dress always the same, with the same hats and the same coats. I'm sure all of you are interesting and have wonderful things about you, but looking at you in the street, you all look so much the same. And that's why I'm talking to you about the psychology of dress. Try and express yourselves better in your... Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product was not to sell it to your intellect that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. I think he originated that idea that they weren't just purchasing something, but they were engaging themselves emotionally or personally in, in, in the product or service. That it's not, you, you think you need a new piece of clothing, but you'll feel better with the piece of clothing. That was his contribution in a very real sense. We see it all over the place today, but I think he originated the idea of the emotional connect to a product or service. Democracy, to my father, was a wonderful concept. But I don't think he felt that all those publics out there would m had reliable judgment, uh, and that they, that they could that they very easily might vote for the wrong man or want the wrong thing, so that they had to be guided from above. You appeal to their desires and their unrecognized longings, that sort of thing. That you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. Many influential thinkers came to believe that the public were incapable of making rational decisions and that as such democracy could never work. Walter Lippmann, one of the most influential political writers at that time, argued that if people were in reality motivated by irrational forces, then what was needed was controlled by the elites to manage what he called the bewildered herd. And this could be accomplished by using psychological techniques to control the unconscious desires of the masses. Of figuring out how to understand how to apply those mechanisms to strategies for uh, social control. Democracy at its heart was about changing the relations of power that had governed the world for so long. And Bernays' concept of democracy was one of maintaining the relations of power, even if it meant that one needed to sort of stimulate the psychological lives of the public. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to the idea of the public as passive consumers. Oh! Driven primarily by instinctual or unconscious desires and that if you can in fact trigger those needs and desires you can get what you want from them. The corporations understood that to change our consumer culture from needs-based to desire-based purchasing people must be trained to want new things even before the old had been consumed. Bernays really is the guy within the United States more than anybody else who sort of brings to the table psychological theory as something that is an essential part of how from the corporate side of how we are going to appeal to the masses he showed the corporations how they could make people want things they did not need by linking products to their unconscious desires and the mass media would be the key the media and marketing men spend billions of dollars in research they have developed an entire science based on the very best psychology that knows exactly which one of our buttons to press to make us swallow an idea or buy a product. And they are not just selling us laundry detergent. They sell us everything from plastic gadgets to warfare. If we are to make decisions about the future of our society, the single most important thing we need is the truth. So I would like us to imagine a nightmare scenario, a powerful group of businessmen with access to the White House who control the media 
and who make obscene amounts of money whenever there's war. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. President Eisenhower's concern about the military-industrial complex, his words have unfortunately come true. He was worried that priorities are set by what benefits corporations as opposed to what benefits the country. Lockheed Martin and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing throughout America. There are factories, there are corporations that are involved on a daily basis.